Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another live stream of our Caring During Cooling series here during HIE Awareness Month, April 2023. This week, we're bringing back a community call with Dr. Lena Shalok, who's going to be talking to us about the conundrum of mild HIE. For the last four years, many groups have been interested in looking at this conundrum of caring for babies with mild HIE. What we know is that mild HIE is not normal. And so these babies, although not included in the original studies, do deserve to be investigated and to pursue potentially beneficial treatments. So in this presentation, Dr. Shalak is going to review with you the past. How did we get to where we are about our understanding with mild HIE and where are we going in the future? I know that some of the information is a little outdated because she has now been funded by PCORI to do an effectiveness trial on these babies. And she'll tell you more about that in the Q&A as well. I hope you enjoy this presentation and stick around to the end, enjoy the Q&A, but also put your comments and questions in the chat below in the comment area, and we'll be sure to continue this conversation. We also have a Facebook group. It is a free group that is open for conversation, sharing of resources. Check the show notes below for information around that. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the rest of this recording over to our presentation with Dr. Lena Shalak from June, 2022. Enjoy the presentation. Um, welcome, everybody. We appreciate you joining from wherever you are in the world. And it is really my honor and privilege and joy to be able to present this session to our Synapse Care community on such an important topic, this topic of mild HIE, this conundrum of care medically, scientifically, ethically, family-centered care from every dimension, mild HIE right now is really top of mind. But let me tell you a little about this person who is going to bless us for the next hour. Dr. Lena Shalak is the current interim chief at UTA Southwestern System of NICUs, including Parkland and Children's in Dallas. She is the director of the Neuro NICU. She has been a passionate educator and researcher of the newborn brain for decades. And yet she still only looks 20 like she was when I first met her. So it is really our pleasure to have Professor Lena Shalak with us today. And without further ado, I just want you to take it away and to share all of your genius with us. Thank you so much, Kathy. You see why I cannot say no, because with so, such a kind start, how could you not be part of this group and talk about your favorite topic? And I hope that we make some strides in our understanding and plan of care for those babies. I have no conflicts to disclose. I do want to start with a few slides about the pathophysiology. And I think it's very important. I promise it's not going to be too much in depth, but just enough to understand the complexity of the problem. When the fetus has any issues with placental supply, usually right around the time of birth or preceding, the integrity of the neurovascular unit as a whole is affected because the brain is shifting to an anaerobic environment where you have very limited ATP production, and I'm not gonna pull any crazy ATP stuff on you, but you go to a very small number of molecules that produce energy. And that affects the functioning of these neurons and of the connections and synapses and pathways and precipitates a cascade of events that goes on even after you get the baby out and you successfully resuscitate and you cannot see it at the level of the naked eye. Luckily for us, not every time there is a cord around the neck or a placental abruption or a previa, the baby is not gonna have a brain injury because we have autoregulation and protective mechanisms at work. So basically there is a range of safe blood pressure where the blood flow that you see here, even though your blood pressure could be changed, the blood flow remains intact. And sometimes for premature babies or developmentally term babies, it could be a little steeper, but there is still lots of protective mechanisms that keeps the brain from a complete shutdown and from having hypoxic ischemic injury. 
Again, I said a few slides about pathophysiology, and an easy way to look at this one is the diving reflex that all mammals have when they go underwater. For a short period of time, the body adapts, and you have normal cardiac output, and there is redistribution to the most vital organs, which essentially is brain, the heart, and the adrenals. So basically, if you have a heart rate, a blood pressure, and a brain, everybody else can adjust and compensate later on. And those babies, we don't even know that they had a problem at birth. They look beautiful. If you are doing cord blood gas values for any reason, you might detect some fetal acidosis, but no other clinical manifestations. However, when you have a longer insult, you impair these abilities of the brain to autoregulate, and you start to see a cerebral blood flow being affected. And this low oxygen, low ATP environment is causing this cascade of events that we talked about. And there is a tiny window of opportunity for therapeutic interventions before the secondary energy failure in this whole cascade of event kicks in. And it is the extent of the secondary energy failure that dictates the final outcomes of these babies and the clinical presentation is neonatal encephalopathy. The key here is that the neonatal encephalopathy is progressive and dynamic. And it was beautifully captured by Dr. Sarnet and Sarnet in the 70s, where detailed serial examinations in the first week of life determined that infants that have moderate or severe encephalopathy in that first week of life or the one that have the abnormal outcomes. And the quick way to remember the progression of the encephalopathy is that early on you have a sympathetic response, like a fight and flight. Your pupils are dilated, you're alert, you're hyperreactive. Then you have a parasympathetic dominated response with lethargy, weak reflexes, and you have constricted pupils. And you can start to have seizures during that uh, second phase or um, moderate encephalopathy as described by Dr. Sarnak. And the last is severe, severe involvement, flaccid exam, no tone, no reflexes. The way I think about it is the lights are on, there is nobody in the house. It's very sad when we watch those babies with severe encephalopathy. The good news is that we see so little of those babies with advances in OB, neonatal care, and neuronicu programs. So a lot of the patients that we're going to see are going to be mild or moderate encephalopathy. But the trick here is the presentation is not always immediately at birth and at the same time point. Some babies could have an insult before birth or acute on chronic or right at birth or even following resuscitation if the resuscitation did not go well. And their clinical progression on the encephalopathy and on the EEG is going to be based on the time, not just the severity of that original insult. And I think that is a fundamental slide to understand why we struggle early on after birth to classify the severity of the encephalopathy. The biggest challenge is we have this limited therapeutic window and the time is brain and we need to put the baby on the cooling blanket within six hours before this whole excitotoxic cascade of event kicks in and determines the final outcome. And we know from all the randomized trials and we know from the subsequent trial for late initiation of cooling that you do not get the same benefit if you cool between six and 24 hours. So the risk reduction is 2% if you cool between six and 24 hours, and it's 25% with a number needed to treat of one in six if you cool in the first six hours. So it's fundamentally important to know who is at risk within six hours. We cannot use the full serial examination in that first week of life that is really sensitive to tell us who is at risk. We have to make our best educated guess. The trials had to reckon with these realities and they had to look at the tip of the iceberg and use a modified SARNAT exam, six simple categories that could be done immediately after birth. And they decided that empirically three out of six, either as moderate or as severe, 
or a combination of three abnormalities as moderate or severe would qualify for the cooling to be started. And we know that these infants tremendously benefit from cooling, a disease that we thought was not fixable and determined by the insult that happens at birth. Now we could modify it if we intervene early enough. The other big problem is this modified Sarnet, when you look at it in the first six hours, uh, definitions are overlapping. And even when definitions are overlapping, babies don't line up into all mild, all normal, or all moderate. They have overlapping features. They have changing examination, even with the level of consciousness, which is the most specific uh, distinct feature between mild and moderate. Infants could oscillate between those two. And with serendipity, this is how I started with one of my earliest paper describing the challenges of the early exam and discovering that lots of these infants will have problems because they're oscillating and 25% would have persistent encephalopathy, although in the first six hours, we couldn't tell for sure. The follow-up paper after these original observations 20 years ago was done with one of my fellows at that time, Tara Dupont that since we started the initiation of hypothermia in clinical practice for those infants with moderate and severe, at Portland, we have a huge database and we have strict protocols. She looked at the infants that did not meet the cooling trial exam criteria, either had some abnormalities or had a normal exam. And she compared them to those that received hypothermia therapy. And even without any protocol at that time, we discovered that 20% had abnormal short-term outcomes, including one that progressed to severe encephalopathy and died, highlighting the importance of studying this patient population that was not included in the prior trials. More and more data started to come up from our European colleagues who are really good at longitudinal cohorts showing that even though you didn't have moderate or severe HIE, with the milder insults, you still have problems. The longer you follow up the baby, the more you see them. Behavioral functioning, attention, memory, language skill, these are all reported in infants with either needing resuscitation or a milder form of encephalopathy at birth. So now 20 years after those original trials, have shown us that we could transform the outcomes and the care for infants with moderate and severe HIE, three out of six categories using the strict criteria. What do we do for those other infants that were not included in the trials? Some of them were kept by intent to treat, meaning they didn't meet the original trials criteria, but they entered the study and they were kept in the study. And those overall in the randomized trials are less than 100, and it show trends toward improvement, but no power. If that line crosses this one, it means we're not 100% sure because of the small numbers in these original trials. And then we have tons of prospective and retrospective cohorts describing that these infants as part of a large group with HIE, as small numbers with mild, variable duration of follow-up and different outcomes being tested. And if we lump all of those studies together over the last 20 years since the original trials, it shows that about 25% of those babies with mild HIE would be at risk for abnormal neurodevelopmental outcomes two years and on. In relation to that, registries confirm a therapeutic creep, meaning if you look at the Vermont database at one snapshot in time, about 40% of those babies don't meet the cooling trial criteria and are mild without a real definition of what is mild. Same for Toby, Australian registries. And if you look at overall practice of care in the UK, at 75% are cooling those infants with mild HIE. The problem is when they're cooled, nobody reports what's the outcomes of those cooled babies compared to those that were not cooled. And there was no definition specific to how do you define mild in the first six hours of life. And this is how the PRIME study started. Guillerme and I started this at one of the PAS meetings and rallied six other sites that really 
we're interested in looking prospectively at a broad definition, looking at outcomes in untreated infants to validate a definition in the first six hours. We used a broad definition on purpose where anybody who had the fetal acidosis, the acute perinatal event at birth, and did not have a normal exam on the modified Sarnet score would be eligible for our definition of mild HIE as long as they did not have three out of six categories as either moderate or severe. And the findings were striking. 52% of those infants had abnormal short-term outcomes and 16% met the official criteria of disability that was set by the early trials based on the NIHHD definition. 40% had Bailey scores under 85. Luckily, less severe disease and very few with CP and autism. When we looked at each component of the examination, activity, feature, tone, upon admission, and serially, and divided the groups into those that had no disability and those that had disability at two years, there was no specific features in the exam that was more predictive than others. About 40% of those who developed disability continued to have slight abnormalities on the discharge exam. And therefore, the PRIME study, the results of which are published, so I'm not going to go into big detail, really allowed us to validate the definition in the first six hours of life, to link it with both short and two years outcome, and furthermore, establish a scoring criteria instead of the empirical thresholding, since it is a continuum. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more of that score because this is something that you could do at the bedside that is actually helpful and that was validated by our group and others. If you give one point for each one of the six categories. So basically, suck and moral count as one category. You can't just grade both. You just lump the category here. And zero would be a normal exam. One would be mild, two would be moderate, and three would be severe. So each of the six categories would have a score from zero to three with a possible total from zero, which is a completely normal exam, to 18, which is six severe categories affected. And that total score is similar to the Thompson score that has been validated with the cooling trials. But the only difference is it really includes those with the mild. So it's the lower end of the score is being tested and evaluated now. And examples of a total SARNAT would be this particular baby having a whole bunch of mild abnormalities. And in this particular case, you count the mild abnormalities. You have here one zero, and then you have here another zero, and then you have one, two, three, you count all the primitive reflexes as one, and four, or the autonomic system as one. So you have a score of four, and that infant has mild encephalopathy. You could also have two abnormalities that are moderate, and the remaining could be either mild or normal, and that infant would have a score of, let's say, two plus two, that's four. And if he has mild features, would be five, six, and you continue to add on like this. And what we showed in a spinoff from the prime study is that a total score of above four was really having very high predictive value to determine the infants that develop disability. Keep in mind, not everybody with a score of four will have disability because here you have with the group with no disability and normal outcome, half of them had a score above four, the other half had a score that is lower. But really, for those that end up with disability, it's a good way to discriminate those infants. And multiple other studies, retrospective and prospective, confirm that there is about five IQ difference and a slightly shifting of the curve for those infants who have mild HIE using definitions in the first day of life. And that puts us at, what do we do with those infants? Should we call them? Should we not? Lots of unanswered questions to consider while we are searching for the best evidence. And while we are doing the search, the California registries show us that doubling in the incidence of cooling in infants that have mild HIE is reported. 
confirming the therapeutic creep and UK population confirmed the same thing. About half of the patients schooled are mild HIE. I've done multiple surveys. One of them was through Newborn Brain Society and about 50% of the participants would cool, the remaining would not. And that number would go slightly up to 70% if the babies had features of uh, moderate and some of mild. The big thing is summarized in the survey from the UK. We don't wanna make mistakes and to err is human and the exam is evolving and progressive. And it is so difficult to make these gradation and classification immediately after birth. And some of those babies might progress and the data showing risk for untreated infants to have long-term adverse outcomes is what determines why some of those people are calling these infants in the UK. Of course, the mitigating factor here is that we do not have comparisons to know that cooling is as efficacious in this group than in the other group. And it can have potential side effects and prolonged hospitalizations and perhaps unnecessary costs are to be considered. Medically, legally, it becomes important to know how you document this. The AAP has not revised its latest recommendation in 2014, which is to cool infants with moderate and severe HIE is standard of care, but have left it for room for interpretation as to you could consider cooling for mild HIE or for a 35 weeker, depending on your standard practice of care at that institution. Ethically, it becomes very important to make these right decisions and to offer parents and families the help that they need and to look into the safety and the efficacy of cooling in this patient population. And in this special issue of seminars in fetal neonatal medicine, myself with a group of colleagues, internationally experts in the field, review some unanswered questions regarding who to provide therapeutic hypothermia for when you have the range of neonatal encephalopathy. And I would encourage you, it's online, it's available online to look at this comprehensive review. But I could tell you one thing for sure. We know for a fact that hyperthermia is bad for the brain. You see it in this animal model where even minutes of exposure to hyperthermia is associated with severe histopathological brain injury. We also know from the animal models that the shorter duration of the insult, when it comes 10 minutes instead of the 20 and 30 minute that you see with moderate and severe HIE, the better the histopathological protection for those animals when you cool them, which is very encouraging. But we also know that if it's a totally normal brain, some of the sham studies done with a group by Hopkins really show us that you could have potentially apoptosis in a normal brain if you induce cooling for no reasons. And the trials, like I said, were not powered to address the safety and the efficacy specific to the mild HIE population. There are lots of things that we do not know from separation, from the mother-infant bonding, breastfeeding, hospital stay, and cost-effectiveness studies have not been done in this patient population. We really also have started to uncover that the MRI abnormalities are subtle. They're not exactly your basal ganglia. From the PRIME study, only two babies progressed to moderate and severe and had this basal ganglia pattern. What we see is more pinpoint white matter injury, sometimes bleeding, sometimes watershed infarctions in infants with mild HIE. And we've developed and looked at multiple scorings with uh, Michelle Monkey, one of our neonatal neurology fellow in collaboration with Linda DeVries and her group. And the detailed scorings are the one that give us the most information. 50% of babies with mild HIE would have abnormalities using the detailed scorings compared to only about 20% using the other scores, which were developed for those with moderate and severe HIE. And we talked about the importance of the long-term follow-up. There are lots of studies that are piloting right now. And the time study in California is important. They're having difficulty to recruit because of the 
loss of equipoise and the therapeutic creep. But there is also in the UK a study that really changed its design. So now everybody is cooled, but they randomized cooling to shorter duration, 48 hours versus 72 hours. And we're awaiting the results from these important studies. But the current situation that I've tried to summarize in this overview is increasing drift in practice, loss of equipoise, ethical concerns, and real world practice that is variable. And uh, that gets us to the point of effectiveness studies. And what do parents have to say when we physicians and nurses and stakeholders were not even, the other stakeholders were not even certain about what to do. And we know that parents want to be involved in the decision-making of their particular baby and of the trials in general. And so I partnered with Mrs. Betsy Pilon that some of you know to form a focus survey group for mild HIE. And what we discovered is short-term variables like being in the hospital for three days or interruption of breastfeeding for three days, these were not too important. On a scale of one to five, this was not a decision driver. On the other hand, three to four month outcomes with bonding and attachment and breastfeeding were felt to be more important on that scale by the majority of the participants. And um, MRI was felt to be important for prognosis, but not for decision-making. Important for decision-making would be the two-year outcomes and the six-year outcomes for the families when we're developing and planning trials. And so not surprisingly, because of the controversies and lack of standardization and practice, most of the parents would not consent to a randomized trial. They prefer effectiveness design based on the site practice or involving the parents in the decision making. And that was confirmed with a larger survey done with two institutions and two foundations, Hope for HIE and CP Foundation. And I've just published these results in Journal of Pediatrics 2022. It should be in press and really it emphasizes the importance of engaging our stakeholders, all of our stakeholders in our decision making. The other good news that I have to share is it looks like PCORI gave us a very good score. We're awaiting the final notice of funding for Cool Prime that I've launched with the help of 15 sites to look at longitudinal outcomes based on site practice. So we're not randomizing, we're stratifying based on the site practice. Seven of the listed sites cool those babies routinely and the eight remaining sites do not. And so we could compare and follow longitudinally with a specific algorithms. Hopefully we'll get the notice of funding and we should be able to start in November. I will keep you posted. I am excited, but I've been trying to get the study off the ground for two years. So I learned to um, just wait and be positive and optimist that based on parents' input that we have designed a study that will help us decide how to power the next studies and the next trials and how to move forward in this field where we're a little stuck. And the important take-home messages so far that we have addressed before I give you the bedside, what to do, is that we need to engage our families in every single step from designing a study and a trial into implementation and dissemination. And at the bedside now, it is so hard to know the difference between mild and moderate. I think I've made my case that it is a continuum and that things are fluid, dynamic, and changing at the bedside. The biomarkers that we have are very good for severe. It's not as good for those with subtle mild to moderate distinction. And I'm studying new types of precision biomarkers, but these are small studies, small number of patients. So this is where the future goes, a precision methodology to track in real time who's progressing from mild to moderate and to be able to provide therapies accordingly. But meanwhile, what do we do? Well, I would encourage you to read this review that I wrote with an algorithm of care for mild hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. 
and it is available in clinics of perinatology online also. The key thing that I've done at my site is I have a standard order set for any baby that has HIE, not just moderate and severe that we are cooling. We follow them with blood gases, liver enzymes. We follow them with documenting their exam on EPIC and the worst exam. We do serial exams. So encourage your providers at the bedside. If you are somebody who is taking care of a baby with mild HIE and there is an MD who came and did an exam at two hours and said the baby does not qualify, I would encourage each and every one of you to keep track of this baby. And if there is anything that you do not like, or if you think the baby might be having a subtle seizure or a change in exam, call back that provider at the bedside, document your exam, do an EEG or an amplitude EEG early on, because if you don't do it, how else are you gonna be able to tell if they are having subtle seizures? I encourage the placenta to be sent for pathology. I encourage an MRI to be done on all of those babies. It helps us, A, confirm the source of the encephalopathy, make sure it is hypoxic ischemic and nothing else, help us prognosticate for our families and send those babies for early referral and follow-up. And I definitely recommend doing an, either an amplitude EEG or an EEG in that first six hours, preferably up to 24 hours, because if you see those bad tracings, that Kathy and I talk about in all our symposiums, that baby is not mild. So you just automatically reclassify. And if you see seizures, that baby is not mild either. By definition, reclassify. And I've got this algorithm where, again, we go about their need of reclassification based on serial exam, the diagnostic etiologies, and the importance of following the trajectory of long-term outcomes for those babies as much as your hospital settings would support and provide. And if in doubt, refer and consult with your pediatric neurology team and neuronic UT. I'm grateful for my team. They make everything I do so much fun and they help me implement and care for those babies so that we could move toward helping answer the conundrum of care for this patient population. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am very happy to answer any questions that could come in the discussion that would be helpful for us to provide care for this challenging group of infants with so many knowledge gaps remaining in their care. First off, Lena, thank you. That was such a good review and I just think I can just Tell everyone is so excited about all of your different research that you're doing and their your papers. They're asking for all the links. So I was trying to like quickly put all the links there. So I'll wait for a few questions to come in. So there's a couple here. I don't know if you want me to read them for you. Is that easier? And then you can answer. I, the one that I see is from Wendy Rogers. Hi, Wendy. The question about the total Sarnat score. Yes, I use it and I document it. It's easier than to say mild or moderate because that situation is shifting, right? So, so I use the mild moderate and I second that with what is my score now and what is my score in two hours. I think it's very important. Some institutions that are already providing cooling as their standard of care find it useful to justify, to say, hey, I've got a score of five or more that rather than just randomly cooling everybody that comes to their door with any degree of mild encephalopathy. Even for the sites like us that are not cooling at this minute, it helps us with documentation and with providing the MRI and the follow-up care for those infants. Excellent. Will you talk a little bit, for those people who are less familiar with clinical research and RCTs, will you talk a little bit about what the difference is between these RCTs and effectiveness and, yes. and how will yes. it really guide practice when people look for that level one RCT? Yes. yes. So typically the convention and the standard is a level one. The highest level of evidence is we randomize. Basically, it's like tossing a coin. We do not know who's going to receive hypothermia. We do not know who's going to receive normothermia because these babies were never compared head to head. We have people that mm. call, we have people that don't call. We've never compared head to head the mild HIE group. 
So then it would take about, you do some power calculations with statisticians help. Usually it's about somewhere between 400 to 500 infants at a minimum. So you have to have multiple sites for this to be really conclusive. And then the randomization or tossing the coin ensures that we don't have selection bias. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you call everybody that you think is looking bad and there's some they're like, Meh, not so much, or their parents you don't like, or you discriminate for whatever variable reasons, you end up with the outcome being different, but not because of the cooling, because of all these other factors. So because of that, randomization is the highest level of evidence. However, there are times when you don't have enough equipoise to say that I'm not sure it's a 50-50, I'm ready to toss a coin. And you're like, no, I'm not ready to toss a coin. I might have unanswered things, but the practice has already happened and the parents could not agree to the tossing of the coin. Then what do you do? You could either scream bloody murder and say, we have gaps in knowledge, there's nothing we could do, blah, blah, blah. Or you're like, okay, let me find what's the next best thing. The next best thing is pragmatic real life. And that's basically when we call it effectiveness rather than efficacy. Effectiveness means, okay, this is the real world. Some people are being cooled, some people are not. Let me try to stratify. You have different statistical way to compensate for the fact that you don't randomize. So you adjust for their age, for their sex, for the maternal level of education. You adjust for these little things, for the total SARNAT score, so that they're comparable in the groups that are receiving cooling and not, and you find the next best evidence. And that's what we are proposing to do with our upcoming cool prime study. Cross fingers, I will get the official notice of funding by next month. It's on the verge of happening, but I've been fooled before by thinking it's gonna happen. I think the conventional approach is so much stuck on RCTs that people have difficulty understanding these novel or new statistical concepts of trials. It is the new future though. This is how our colleagues, when it came to discontinuation of seizure medications after discharge were able to answer the question. I think lots of our new studies and trials are gonna be effectiveness. When you cannot do an RCT, you cannot just sit and moan and cry. You just have to do the next best thing. Documentation is also critical and follow-up is also critical for this patient population. Just calling it mild is a misnomer. It's not really the data shows the patients that I see in follow-up. I cannot tell if it's mild or moderate. Treated versus mild untreated, I can't tell the difference when I see them. I see uh, some other questions. What about uh, the one about the Starnet versus Thompson? Yes. So for different places in the world or yes. even the U.S.? It's a good question. It's potato versus potato, right? So if you're <laughs> in the U.K. or in the U.S., In the UK, you call it a Thompson score. In the US, you call it a Sarnat score. The only practical difference is that Thompson includes things like feeding, things that are really not applicable in the first six hours. But if you remove that and you just use the Thompson, it's the similar thing. It it hasn't been validated for mild HIE. For Mm. the Sarnat score, I validated those with the prime studies. But they all work beautiful. Whatever system you're using to score the severity of the HIE, I would encourage you to use it and to document that. The lower end of the score is validated with the total SARNAT score, with our prime study and with marble study from the UK. Bettina's asking about the algorithm and working in these maybe outlying non-cooling centers that refer in and wanting to know Maybe just how do you see applying your algorithm to those centers? And then maybe just reiterate the benefit of cooling after six within that first 24. Very good question, Bettina. Thank you so much for bringing this up. My recommendation would be, if in doubt, better to refer. If you cannot refer, at least make sure you could initiate an amplitude EG to make sure this baby is in the right classification mode. I would really encourage referral if in doubt. It's worth it because it's tricky and things are fluid, especially if you don't have the capacity to keep an eye on this baby tightly for the first day of life. And I say the first day of life because at my site, the standard of care is cooling moderate and severe or anything that you think might be moderate or severe in the first six hours. 
but also to continue to examine them up to 24 hours and to cool those that have any evidence of seizures or moderate or severe progression in that first 24 hours. The reason is it's better than nothing. It's not as good as cooling the first six hours, but it's better than not cooling at all. So to me, the way I look at it, if I was a parent of a baby with mild HIE, 2% is better than 0% improvement. And from that perspective, I would recommend that if in doubt and up to 24 hours, anybody who has a seizure, anybody who has a suppressed EEG or amplitude EEG, anybody who you think the exam is evolving or could be evolving needs to be cooled and referred. If you don't have an EEG, it's okay. The cooling trials did not include EEG or amplitude EEG in their criteria. So it's not an inclusion, it's an exclusion. So to me, if you have it, it helps you make sure that you don't have moderate or severe, but if you don't have it, it's okay. Yeah, I was going to mention that there is a scoring app that was developed by the group at Sharp Mary Birch in San Diego with exactly what you're saying, Lena, the serial exam, especially in that first 24 hours, they use it to help get the babies referred. I think it's called Neo Cool. And if you have an iPhone, you can go to the app store and it has, it's really designed for referral. So I think it's perfect, Bettina, like you were saying in your level two, who should I send? So it's not does the baby have mild, moderate, or severe, but does the score get high enough to refer? And they used it in their community to help not miss those babies in that first six hours of life. And they taught the community nursery nurses to do this at hour one, three, and five, but you could continue that out for even, even longer. And do you want to also address the question about poor gases, Lena? Would you admit all babies with poor gases and do serial exams? This one I have the answer for. And the answer is no, you do not have to admit everybody with a core pH that is abnormal. I work at Portland. I have 14 southern births. If I was to admit every single baby, then there'll be not enough nurses and not enough physicians to take care of them. But I make sure that the newborn provider examines them. And if they have any doubts, I make sure that we bring them to the NICU. So any suspicion, even like a sniff or the wrong, like the baby's <laughs> yawning, I'm not sure, is it a seizure? Bring it on. I usually follow up guests to make sure they're clearing. Clearing the fetal acidosis is very important, whether they're in the NICU or in the in the newborn nursery, how fast they clear it. But some babies are stuck with base deficit and some of them have infection in addition to asphyxia and some mm-hmm. of them have very severe asphyxia. So I always worry, when the metabolic acidosis is not clearing. I think use your judgment. If the exam is completely normal, the baby looks and smells good to you, leave them with their mother is what I would recommend. There's a question. One of these topics very dear to you is mirrors and the use of mirrors. And so I know it's a newer technology you're exploring with babies with HIE. Do you have any sense of how it may be used for inclusion or exclusion or to help direct decisions if someone has access? Yeah, I'm using it in my research to integrate with the EEG to give us like these heat maps. And I didn't go in details because it's research and I really wanted this to be a clinical forum. I will tell you the plain NIRS as it is, if you have it in your practice and you're part of a neuronic program, use it again as an exclusion criteria like the amplitude EEG because when you see evidence of high NIRS value, like values above 85, the 90, 95, the whole machine is like, well, I can't read anymore. It's so high. That is evidence of a reperfusion injury. That is when Kathy describes to you, the Hurricane Katrina is all done and now the flooding has happened. Yeah. So it's already too late. It's basically the baby has progressed to a more severe stage. So for those babies, I would use it as an exclusion criteria. If you put the NIRS on and it's reading 95, well, guess what? That doesn't look like it's mild to me. So that would be definitely a baby to move over and to get your consultants to help guide the care of that baby. NIRS itself is not sensitive within the real spectrum of mild. We can still see abnormal outcomes on those babies and we can't really tell from NIRS what those babies are based on my research. Excellent. Circling back to the clearing you had mentioned, we have a couple questions in the Q&A area about maybe using some of the other serum biomarkers. So do you use the lactates? Do you use LFTs? Do you use CK? You know, if the exam is normal. Yes, yes, I use LFTs and gaze and lactate. 
uh, pick your favorite weapon and use it is what I would say. <laughs> the, more, the more documentation and evidence we have that this is a multi-organ disease and it's affected more than the brain, the more case you could make for labeling it as HIE and not other causes of neonatal encephalopathy mm. and for early referral and early intervention for those babies. Excellent. Okay. Mustafa is saying thank you. So I think I, we got both of those. I would say anytime your nurse calls you to redo your exam, please do it ASAP for any physicians on the line or on the camera and about one to two hours if there is anything that somebody tells you that is changing or about one to two hours it is tedious and it's hard make it a practice to document your worst exam that's a good advice okay if you don't have if, if you don't have the bandwidth you can do the exam but you can't document every five seconds document your worst and act mm -hmm. on your worst exam that is a straightforward, simple advice. Say that again, act yes. on the so worst. If he was mild and now is moderate, and then after 30 minutes is looking mild again, it doesn't matter. Once It's a threshold. Once you hit the threshold, go for it. It's a continuum. It's a spectrum. Things are fluid. Once you hit the threshold, go for it. And cool. oh, I think that's I think that's really a really strong important message because we I see this in the many places I go is the baby looked bad but then got better and I think it's so important what you said if you were bad you You're bought bad. a ticket you yeah. bought a ticket sorry yes but it's a circle of trust <laughs> you know uh, exactly. there are some good questions on the MRI Kathy do you want me yeah. to do you want to read them for me or do you want me to read them? Sure. I think there's one that I thought was really great. If you can only get one, when would you get it? If I could only get one, I would get it around day five. Or if it's if the baby's discharged earlier than the day of discharge. Four to five is my sweet spot. But if the baby is a superstar and is three and a half days, go ahead, do it. Better than not doing it. Great. And then I know some places are doing two. So if you could get two, if it was payable in your state. If I get two and I was so lucky and so fortunate to get two, I probably would do one right around 24, 36 hours. That's when the mm. reperfusion injury is peaking, the flooding and Hurricane Katrina. So you could identify those that are mislabeled. And then I would do one before discharge. Okay. So I know some places are doing like a 10 to 14 day to really see the settling in. What do you think yes, about this I think later the issue one? is babies with mild HIE, they're not going to stay 10 to yes. 14 days. Even the, yeah, the longest was like a 12 day, I think, uh, that I've had in prime and subsequently to prime in my other research studies. They don't stay as long as yeah. the other babies. A, because we're not cooling them. Two, because things improve and resolve. They might have slight abnormalities on discharge, but they're not needing a hospital stay. There is another question, I guess, regarding the MRI before we close it. Sure. Uh, since we were talking about the MRI, I'm trying to find it. Okay, um, MRI sedation or no sedation. And if you're cooling, when is the time? The timing, if you're cooling, would be similar to those with moderate and severe, which is five to seven days. Around five days still works. There is pseudo normalization that happens, but it's really not in that time course. So I think you're good with getting that MRI at that time. No sedation for sure. Bundle, swaddle, feed your favorite <laughs> transport nurse. And we've never had to use sedation for those babies, never ever. Just the right approach of bundling and team, cohesive team is what it takes. I would just go back to Amit Mathur's paper on sedation-free MRI, and he has some great photos and nursing procedures for sedation-free MRI. And I know that procedure has been used in many centers now successfully. So if you're struggling, that's a good place to begin to just show the pathway to that. And there is one more question from Bettina that it has to do with if, why would you do a serial exam between six and 24 hours? Because there is a randomized trial that was the late cooling conducted by NICHD, NIH, published in JAMA. That is level one evidence. Uh, they used Bayesian analysis, again, because the number of babies between six and 24 hours are less than the number of babies that are randomized within six hours. But that trial really, for me, is objective evidence, even though we don't cool babies in the first six hours with mild HIE, if they progress 
in their exam between six and 24 or have seizures, which is why I would like to continue to examine them, then I'm justified based on level one evidence to call them. So that is my justification. There are always people that say, oh, it's not as good. Yes, it's not as good, but it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. So that's my logic here. Yeah. Jamie mentioned in the Q&A area that there are some centers that are doing universal core gas screening for all deliveries. And I do that. I recommend you do that, that, right? I love that. I just, I won't bring them all to the NICU. That's all. Okay. So does that help Jamie? If it does, let me know. And then this is something that we discussed on our newish call on Wednesday. It came up active versus passive cooling. And I want you, Lena, to share your thoughts on this active versus passive. What does it mean? Oh my and gosh. How- Three minutes before we finish, <laughs> most controversial topic on mild HIE. Trust Kathy. <laughs> Ask me this. I'm not going to answer that one. I am conservative on that one. Yeah. Much more conservative than a lot of the people. Or what I'm going to say is you could do harm sometimes. The key is monitoring. If you cannot continuously monitor that temperature, then sometimes the act of passive could be fraught with problems. So I am more conservative than most people on this because I have I know that babies with severe injury cannot regulate. And you just you overshoot, you undershoot. And I know for sure that temperature extremes are dangerous. So if you cannot keep your baby between 33 to 34, then it's better not to. Uh, the reason is we know from the optimizing cooling with deeper and longer, the deeper cooling is bad. So you're actually in danger if you're not continuously monitoring mm-hmm. that temperature and it goes under. And we know that hyperthermia is bad also. So use your judgment. If the baby's choreo, you might not want to use the warmer. But for the other babies, I would be very cautious about the danger of the temperature swings. So if you can continuously monitor the temperature, proceed cautiously. If not, don't. Yeah. Katie, this is such an important question. And I think some of it comes down to definition, right? What do people mean when they mean active? And what do people mean when they mean passive? So I think in the old days, we what we thought was passive cooling, which is what Lena just described was, just turn off the warmers. What resulted when we say turn off the warmers was that we also turned off what she just said, which was the display of the temperature. What we really meant to say was turn off the external heat or turn it to very low power. So turn your bed from servo to manual then turn down the heat to zero or change your baby's set point to 36 to 35.8 so that you're not getting like what she was saying, if you have a baby with choreo, you're not overshooting. So I think active versus passive, to be honest, a radiant warmer is active cooling. It's not only just in a blanket, right? It's not just a blanket that provides cooling. What you're doing is providing targeted temperature management using whatever tool you have. And with, if you're an out outlying facility and you're waiting for your transport team, ask them, what is my target goal? What's my temperature goal? And then monitor if you have ability to do core temp, if you can do axillary, but continuously monitoring the temperature is where we can avoid the harm that Lena said, which I think is so important. This is a hot topic as well. Lena, last question. Safe to hold during cooling? Yes, yes. (laughs) And enthusiastic, yes. Not only do it, do it, report it, do QI on it, and come present on it. Everybody needs to do it. Our nurses love it. Our parents love it. The babies love it. I love it. Yes. An enthusiastic yes. Excellent. Lena, this was a jam-packed hour. It was amazing. I think we covered so many topics. And I just want to just say thank you. On behalf, You see everyone. They're so excited about your talk. You can see why I will do anything for her anytime she asks me because I want her to come and to share her genius with our group. We are all grateful, Lena, for your tireless work, for your late sleepless nights, for writing these papers, for continuing to apply for these grants, for your partnership with families, because this work is so important. 
and you are leading the science. I know you have a big team and you are part of a big group. And I'm you just listed- humbled to work with the best of the very best. And I have the bestest friend, as, as you see with Kathy, the team and the fostering of this interactive, collaborative communities is really important. And the partnership of the yeah. various discipline is fundamental. I have enjoyed being a guest and mm-hmm. actually I'm not really a guest. I'm part of the family. You are, 100%, say. Um, 100%. Thank you so much for this almost feeling like a live session, but thank you so much. I mean, if you have to jump, I completely understand. We'll just say thank you again. I'll just give a few housekeeping. So caring during cooling is more than just the temperature. There's feeding, there's holding, there's caring, there's assessing. And that's what we've tried to do in this special series of caring during cooling, which was in honor of HIE awareness. And just thank you again, Lena, for being with us and more to come on this. And we're going to continue some other special things through the summer. So I'm excited to announce those later, but... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being with us. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation with Dr. Lena Shalak and that you have some food for thought now as you move forward in considering your unit's practice on managing babies with mild HIE. The decision to cool or not to cool is still out there. There are many centers that are and there are many centers that do not yet. So what is your unit doing and what will be your next steps forward? I hope that this presentation has been helpful in at least outlining some of the basic care that you can provide. And don't forget to grab the link to the slides and some of the references so that you can continue to share this information with others in your unit and in your practice. I also wanted to be sure in case you didn't already hear, we do have more caring during cooling lectures that are available. The link to those are in the show notes below. This is a free 30 day course that allows you to watch the videos on repeat and on demand. You just need to register for it. It's free and you can have access to it for 30 days. There is an upgrade option, which gives you lifetime access to the lectures as well as the option for nursing CEUs. So again, the links are in the show notes and I'd love to see you over there in that um, course as well. If you haven't joined our Facebook group called Caring During Cooling, I would love to see you over there. We have a discussion group where we can share resources and other things there. So I hope you've enjoyed our month-long series of Caring During Cooling. In May 2023, it's International Kangaroo Care Day. So we've chosen some lectures for our Monday live streams that are related to that topic. So I hope to see you in May and have a great rest of your month.